doesn't matter what you do, what you do, as long as you do it with a flair. What effect a little smoke is with a dash of hocus pocus and the scent of burning sulfur in the air. I'm a fraud, a hoax, a charlatan, a joke, but they love me everywhere. For it really doesn't matter what you do, what you do, as long as you do it with a flair. And it really doesn't Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gather round, please. I always like to do things with a flair. <laughs> My name is Professor Emilius Brown. I am here to divert, <laughs> to amuse, yes, even to help. How can I enrich your lives? Well, my humble talents are yours to command. And today, I am going to tell you a fantastic story. It is a true story, and it happened to me. What you say, what you say, you can sell it if you tell it with a sim salabim. The magician's nursery rhyme. Now, it all started in the fall of 1940 in the little coastal town of Pepperidge Eye in England. The Second World War had been on for about a year, and the Germans had conquered most of Europe. Only the narrow English Channel now stood between England and the armies of Germany. The heroine of our story is Eglantine Price, a maiden lady who lived in an old house overlooking the Channel. And because of the bombing of London, many children were moved out into the countryside and assigned to various homes for the duration. Carrie, Charles, and Paul Rollins, who had no parents of their own, had been assigned to live with Eglantine Price. Now, this arrangement was rather unsatisfactory to Eglantine, who felt it would interfere with her practice as an amateur witch. It was also very unsatisfactory to the children, and so on their first night at Miss Price's home, they decided to escape and go back to London. But fate has a habit of intervening. Miss Price was taking witchcraft by correspondence, and on that very day, she had received through the mail her first broom. That night, after she had sent the children up to their rooms, she opened the package and began trying to ride her broomstick. After a few false starts, Miss Price said the magic words quite firmly, Lucky Poe, Nickriff, Scrumpet, Leech! And sedately, side saddle, she flew out of the room and into the night sky on her broomstick. Coincidentally, the children had just crawled out of the window of their second story room and were about to skedaddle down the tree when Miss Price flew into view. <laughs> A few moments after catching sight of her, the broom sputtered and dove to the ground where Miss Price landed with an awful crash. The next morning, Charlie, who was the oldest and the leader of the children, accosted Miss Price with the fact that she was indeed a witch. But when Charlie's demands for better living conditions and more delicious food on the table grew too overpowering, Miss Price turned him into a pink rabbit by saying the magic words, filigree, apogee, pedigree, perigee. Miss Price's cat, Cosmic Creepus, almost ate him alive before he returned to his natural form as Charlie. After peace was restored, Miss Price made a bargain with the children. If they would not tell anyone in the village that she was a witch, she would give them something of great value. It was a magic bed knob. And at first, the children didn't think much of the present. But after Miss Price said the magic words over it, Hell a bear, henbane, aconite, glow worm fire, and firefly light, it began to glow dimly. Miss Price told them by turning the bed knob on the bed, the bed would take them any place they wanted to go. The last and most important lesson in the correspondence school of witchcraft had not yet arrived. Instead, Miss Price received a card from me stating that the correspondence school was being closed. Well, this didn't suit Miss Price one bit, I'll tell you. 
She needed that last lesson because she felt it might help England in the war effort against the Germans. And so she determined to go to London and seek me out. Everybody jumped on the bed except Charlie, who didn't believe that the bed really could fly. Miss Price told him that he was in the age of non-believing. And you rush around in hopeless circles Searching everywhere for something true Finally, Paul stated the destination in a strong, clear voice. Take us to Professor Emilius Brown, Headmaster, Correspondence College of Witchcraft, London. Well, now Charlie, now a believer, scrambled on board just as the bed took off with a... for foggy London town. They were looking for me, of course. And I think it's about time that I got into the story in person. I was employed that day as a street vendor peddling simple magic tricks and horns and whistles. Finally, Miss Price found me too and demanded to have the last lesson. And when I refused her because I didn't have it myself, she shouted, Filigree! Apogee! Peregree! Peregee! and turned me into a white rabbit. <laughs> I was really astonished, and when I finally regained my own self and found that Miss Price had learned the spell from my own course, I was really astounded. I had just put some nonsense words that I had found in an old book into the course, but Miss Price apparently had powers far beyond mine, for she had really turned me into a rabbit. <laughs> She now insisted that I produce the last lesson, the one which I had promised on substitutionary locomotion. Well, <laughs> when she learned that all of my magic spells had come from words found in an old book, she insisted on seeing that book. Well, I told her that my home was many miles away on the other side of London, but Miss Price said that we could be there in a trice. And she and the children jumped on the big four-poster bed that was standing right in the middle of the street, and she insisted that I get on the bed also. I was very suspicious of this tomfoolery, and I asked Miss Price if we were going to fly. She replied rather crossly, Really, Mr. Brown, let us not be obtuse, shall we? It is your own traveling spell. The one you have with the course is a bonus. I couldn't believe my own ears. My traveling spell, I said. Th that works as well. Miss Price was still cross. Just the address, please. And so I replied, 8 Winchcliffe Road. And with a... 
the bed became airborne. After a wild ride over the rooftops of London, we were at my home in a trice as promised. And Miss Price and the children were surprised by my home, which is a fine townhouse, which had been abandoned because there was an unexploded bomb in the front yard. While the children were exploring the house, I decided the time had come for a heart-to-heart -heart talk with this wonder-working woman. Combining her magic with my know-how in show business would be boffo box office, as they say in the trade, and I could see visions of millions. Let us strike a bargain. You possess a gift. And I can speak the jargon that will give your gift the needed lift. You possess the know-how, and I command the show-how. Oh, how successful you could be with me. Eglantine, Eglantine, oh, how you'll shine. Your lot and my lot have got to combine. Eglantine, Eglantine, hark to the stars. Destiny calls us, the future is ours. As the shine sells the boot, and the blossoms the fruit. All you need to succeed in your plan is the proper ally upon whom to rely. And I'm your man. For I have an acumen that's nice superhuman. I sell things that nobody can. So I humbly suggest you accept my behest. I'm your man. Eglantine, Eglantine, oh how you'll shine. Your lot and my lot have got to combine. Eglantine, Eglantine, heart to the stars. Destiny calls us, the future is ours. With my expert pantomiming, the proper taste and timing, I'll introduce you in the manner grand. I'll whet their appetite for you. I'll set the scene so right for you. We'll have the beggars eating out of your hand. As the words sell the tune and the moon beams the moon, all you need to succeed in your plan is a champion rare with a flourish and flair. And I'm your man. Eglantine, Eglantine, oh how you'll shine. Your lot and my lot have got to combine. Eglantine, Eglantine, heart to the stars. Destiny calls us, the future is ours. Meanwhile, the children had discovered a nursery with some wonderful old toys. Paul found a crumbled linen children's book called The Lost Isle of Naboombu. Charlie didn't think there could be such a place, but Paul was sure of it. Oh, look, there's pictures. That proves it. The pictures showed a number of jungle beasts wearing clothes amidst beautiful tropical surroundings. Miss Price wasn't interested in entering show business. In fact, Miss Price wasn't interested in anything except finding the book from which I had taken the magic words, and when I couldn't produce it, she turned me back into a white rabbit again. Well, finally, I found it. The book was called The Spells of Astaroth, and within a very few moments, I had been turned back into Emilius Brown again. But I was thoroughly annoyed. I don't mind being changed into a hawk or a tiger or something with a bit of dash to it. But always a fluffy white rabbit. When Miss Price got near to the end of the book, she got a shock. She read, 
substitutionary locomotion, a rare and ancient art of causing objects to take a, on a life force of their own. The spell which creates this force is five mystic words. These words are... But the page was torn and the words were missing. I explained that was why I had closed down the college. Where are the remaining pages? she asked. Well, haven't the foggiest, I replied. Where did you get the book? she asked. Well, I bought it uh, from a bloke off a pushcart, I said. A bit of an unpleasantness. He claimed that I'd, I'd given him a dud coin. And there was a scuffle over the manuscript. It tore and, uh, well, I got one part and he got the other. Where might one find the other portion of the book? asked Miss Price sternly. And the only place that I could possibly suggest that it might be found is Portobello Row. <laughs> and treasures, yesterday's pleasures, once proud possessions and heirlooms of old, dented and tarnished, scarred and unvarnished, in old Portobello their port and their soul. Shazam books. Censored and banned books. Volume of alchemy, voodoo and zen. Bibles and bride books. Revenue's guidebooks. A black magic course from a sorcerer's pen. Silver pill boxes. Taxidermed proxy. The Stolly Gold to pick of Henry VIII. Well used by Shelley, a bruised Botticelli, religious equipment of every known faith. The Count of the Malta, the rings of Ardaja, a filigreed samovar owned by the Tsars, an ancient mosaic, a scroll in Hebraic. The snipper that clipped out King George's cigars. Portobello Road, Portobello Road, straight where the riches of ages are stowed. Anything you're purchasing is more than it seems. You're buying the story of mystery and dreams. Once it's closing time on Portobello Road, the barrows and vendors disappear as if by magic. And soon we found ourselves alone in the street, except for a villainous-looking character who approached me. And pressing a long switchblade knife into my side, he said, You ought to get over to the bookman straight away. He wants to see all of you. Well, under the circumstances, I decided we had better go. The kids and Miss Price pushed the bed along with us and right on down into the store of the bookman we went. Well, we soon discovered that the bookman had the missing pages of the magic book. He read from one of them, Substitutionary locomotion, the lost miracle of the ancients, and so on and so forth. Ah, there we are. 
The spell which creates this force is five mystic words. These words are engraved on the diamond star that was always worn by the sorcerer Astoroth. Well, it turns out that the sorcerer Astaroth kept animals in cages and searched for spells which would make them more like humans. Legend is that finally the animals rebelled at the experiment, killed Astaroth, and stole many of his powers, including the star with the spell upon it. The animals found a ship and sailed away. Many, many years later... A shipwrecked man was found half mad with thirst and exposure to the sun. And before he died, he swore that he had seen an island ruled by animals. The bookman told us that he regretted to say that there was no such island. The Isle of Namumbo does not exist. Paul spoke up at this. There is too such a place. I got my own book about it. Now the bookman tried to take the book away from Paul, and finally Miss Price decided it was time to go home. She told us all to jump on the bed, and Paul said loudly, Bed, take us to Naboomboo! And with a we were gone. There was a slight miscalculation in our flight, and instead of landing on the island itself, we landed in the lagoon, and the bed slowly sank to the sand on the bottom. Oh, it was beautiful there, with seaweed and fish of all colors and kinds. How pleasant bobbing along, bobbing along on the bottom of the beautiful briny sea. What a chance to get a better peep At the plants and creatures of the deep We glide far below the rolling tide Serene through the bubbly blue and green It's love Bobbing along, bobbing along on the bottom of the beautiful briny sea. What if the octopus, the flounder, and the cod they think we're rather odd? It's fun to promenade, bobbing along, singing a song on the bottom of the beautiful briny sea. Bobbing along, bobbing along on the bottom of the beautiful briny sea. What if the oyster and the lobster and the soul think we're all the droll? It's good to take a stroll, bobbing along, singing a song on the bottom of the beautiful briny shimmery shiny beautiful briny sea have a banana After a pleasant little underwater dance, we suddenly discovered that a large hook and line had come down into the water and hooked around the bed. The bed and all of us on board were now being pulled up through the water. And when we reached the surface, we realized that we had been caught by an enormous bear. When he saw us, he, he was very unhappy. 
People, people, what scurvy luck, he said. I think I shall throw them back in. But before he could do so, Paul got busy with his book and again said, Here, anybody can see the king. That's the law. The bear didn't think this was such a good idea and replied that if we knew what was good for us, we'd get ourselves thrown back into the water. But Miss Price was insistent. We must see the king on an urgent personal matter, she said. Lead the way, please. When we came near to the king's tent, we learned that he was in a foul mood. Roar after roar came up from his tent. The king's secretary bird stopped us as we came up to the entrance of the tent. The king is angry because the royal football match cannot take place today, and his majesty has so set his heart on it. Bear, throw these creatures back into the sea. Well, it was time for me to step in. Now, just a moment. I can help, I said. I know football. I was captain of the Hotspurs for two years, three seasons with the United before that. Well, with this gladsome news, the secretary bird ushered me into the presence of the king. It was really a small matter that had postponed the game. There was no one to be the referee of the match. <laughs> I volunteered, and so I was elected. The king was delighted, and we immediately went to the stadium. All of us noticed, however, that around the king's neck was the star of Astaroth. Well, the teams lined up. The hippo was the captain of the blues, whose side included a kangaroo, a cheetah, an ostrich, and an elephant. The king's team was called the Dirty Yellows and include a rhino, a crocodile, a hyena, a warthog, and a gorilla. The king shouted, Let the game begin! It was the wildest football match ever. <laughs> and even though as referee, I should have been a privileged character, I was flattened to the turf on several occasions and nearly killed before the game was over. Luckily for all of us, the king's team won. As I congratulated the king and embraced him warmly, I pulled a trick called the gypsy switch, removing the star of Astaroth from the king's neck and placing my referee whistle there in place of it. He was none the wiser and didn't discover the loss until we reached the bed. And then he came roaring after us. Miss Price was forced to turn him into a rabbit in order to enable us to make our escape. But before we knew it, we were back at Miss Price's home in Pepper and Jai. After all our adventures, I was ready for a quiet cup of tea and a rest. But Miss Price insisted that we try the magic formula immediately. For this, she asked me to take off my shoes. <laughs> I was puzzled by this, as were the children, but Miss Price soon made her meaning clear. She would practice substitutionary locomotion with my shoes. Now she asked for the Star of Astaroth, which I had carefully protected in a hanky in my pocket. But I searched every pocket, and it wasn't there. Well, Miss Price was disconsolate. I should have realized, she said. We couldn't bring that object all the way from one world to another. But finally Paul made himself heard and revealed that the magic words had been in his book all the time. Treguna, Mechodes, Trecorum, Satis, D. And so now, Miss Price went to work with a will to bring my shoes to life. Cosmic wizards of timeless times, teach my tongue the transcendental rhymes. Help my mind to find the skill, give my heart the fervent will to summon substitutionary locomotion mystic power that's far. Beyond the wildest notion, it's so weird. 
so feared, yet wonderful to see. Substitutionary locomotion, come to me, I don't want low commotion. Shiery substitution or remote in transitory convolution. Only one precise solution is the key. Substitutionary locomotion. It must be substitution. Miss Price didn't know her own strength, for by the time the song was finished, practically every inanimate object in the house was flying through the air. From her father's sword to Miss Price's nightgown, from Charlie's trousers to Miss Price's glasses. Finally, everything calmed down, and I said to Eglantine, "My dear, the spell seems to work. I'd say you're on your way, but you could use a little firmer control." Having helped to bring things to a more or less happy ending, I said. Well, I ought to be getting a train back to London tonight. Rather important matters there. I'd like to tell you about it, but uh, it is most secret. Well,、uh-huh. Miss Price was downcast at my words. I'm pleased if I have been any help, and I've enjoyed being with you. Will you come back? Asked Miss Price. Some day, my dear. I certainly hope we shall meet again. Some day, when all this war business is over. Perhaps then I shall realize my fondest dream: Eglantine and Emilius, illusionists extraordinary. Oh, just think how that will look on a poster, eh? <laughs> the children will miss you, Miss Price said.、Oh, you really think they will? I replied. Well, I shall certainly miss all of you, and if I don't go now, you may never get rid of me. So, like the fool I was, I left and went down to the railway station, where I learned the next train to London wouldn't be until four o'clock in the morning. And so I sat myself down for a long wait. And the longer I sat, the more I realized what an idiot that I had been to leave. Well, about midnight, I could stand it no longer and decided to go back to Miss Price's house. But when I got there. I found that there were German soldiers standing guard outside. I went around to the back of the house and skillfully climbed up the tree to the second floor and into the window. But I found, to my sorrow and dismay, that Germans were in the house as well, and I was trapped inside the bedroom with two of them trying to batter down the door. Making a fantastic effort, I spit out the words of the rabbit spell: "Filigree, abogee, peregree." And turned myself into a rabbit. When the Germans broke down the door, they were so surprised to see a large rabbit inside. Well, I rushed past them in their amazement, only to find that Miss Price and the children were gone. They had been taken to the old castle for safekeeping, and so I hippity hopped along the road, and soon was in the castle along with them. Well. The spell wore off just as I arrived, and Miss Price and the children were indeed happy to see me. Now I learned what had happened. A team of German commandos were in the process of making a raid on the English coast, a probe to see how strong the English defences really were. We must try them off, I said, and then the idea came to me: substitutionary locomotion. That was the trick, and the old castle served part time as a museum, and it was filled with all kinds of ancient banners and flags and things, armor for horses and men, spears and swords and halberds. So Miss Price set to work. Cosmic wizards of timeless times, teach my tongue the transcendental rhymes, help my mind to find the skill. Give my heart the fervent will to summon substitutionary locomotion, mystic power that's far beyond the wildest notion. It's so weird, so feared, yet wonderful to see. 
Substitutionary locomotion Come to me, I don't want low commo Shiery substitution or remote In transitory convolution Only one precise solution is the key Substitutionary locomotion It must be sub Substitutionary locomotion can create a state of clamorous commotion. It's the spell to quell invasion from the sea. Substitutionary locomotion is the key, the key to guide the tide that's stronger than the ocean. I want substitutionary locomotion. It can cause the force to keep our country free Substitutionary locomotion work for me Then Miss Price shouted out the words with power and dignity. Traguna, Mekonis, Tecorum, Satis, D. And the battle flags fluttered. The regimental drum began to beat. The row of trumpets began to play. A row of halberds rose to the vertical. Armored helmets with visors snapped open with nothing inside. And now armored figures began to move out of the castle. <laughs> Miss Price mounted her broomstick and carrying the flag of Britain flew out into the night air ahead of her army. I led the children out, and behind a hedgerow, we watched the battle. Oh, it was strictly no contest. The Germans were aghast at the sight confronting them, and threw down their guns and ran off the moor, down onto the beach, into the rubber boats, and back to France. The battle was won. The Germans were convinced that England was a strong and terrible foe, and the tight little island could not be invaded. And so... They turned their attention eastward to the Russians. Since Miss Price's workshop had been blown up in the melee, she decided that she would not be a witch anymore. And I decided that to help the war effort, I should join the army. The old home guard had been with us at the end of the skirmish, and they escorted me down to the train and off to the war. Sailing on England, oh, what a shame. 